So we thank you guys that have, have come and uh, have signed up for this. Uh, I, I really expect some uh, God to do some tremendous things over the next 10 weeks. Uh, folks, many of the classes that uh, that are being taught and have been taught through the Raven Institute will primar primarily uh, be for the purpose of uh, really informational or instructional teaching. And some of you guys have taken some of the classes. And uh, these courses, they serve really kind of as a primary function of, of educating you so that you might have the right information that's going to be necessary to uh, really sufficiently carry out uh, that particular calling that God has on your life. So some of you guys that have taken some of the classes, you've seen that classes like church history uh, or theology one that Pastor Sam is teaching now, uh, apologetics. What are, what are those things doing? Those things are giving us the information that we need to really lay down a foundation. And, and, and they provide really information that we have to have. It's going to be essential. Uh, then we have classes like the homiletics and the, the hermeneutics and the church planting. And those things give us some practical, really, how-tos uh, in regards to the... Oh, I'm losing this for Check. One, two. Is it a receiver? Let me shift it over here. I think it is. Let me just be up. I know, it's brand new. Anyway, the homiletics, hermeneutics, the church planning, things of that nature, they give us some, uh, some how-tos in regards to the application of those learning principles. Some of you guys have taken those classes. And so it's not just I have information. It's like, okay, here's what you now do with the information. Some of you guys took the, uh, the homiletics, and you learned how to, to, how to construct and put together a message. You went through the church planting. You know, this is a church planting ministry, so it gives you some of the building blocks for that. And the reason that this class here, though, doesn't have a textbook is, uh, apart from, obviously, the, the Bible, is because it's not something that's merely instructional or informational. And so it's going to be a little bit different, probably, than any other class that, that, that I've taught or any of the other instructors at the Raven Institute teach. Uh, it could probably be categorized as more inspirational, transformational, spiritual in the sense that it's uh, it's something that's not going to be totally aimed at your head, but it's going to be aimed at our hearts. And so we, we give a lot. I mean, we're very much discipleship oriented. We believe that you need to be able to give an answer to any man that would ask for that reason, the hope that's within you. But there's got to be a reason behind that. Not just a reason that says it's because of the Bible, but there's got to be something that drives and compels each and every one of us. And so for me, uh, speaking on a personal level, so I, and I'm, I'm going to be over the next 10 weeks, what you're going to get, the reason there's not a textbook, because I'm just going to give you what God has written on the epistle of my heart over the next uh, couple of months. And so for me, if my walk in this ministry was just built upon information, I do not believe that we would see the impact that we see. I do not believe that we would see the miracles, literally, that we've seen strung together over so, so many years. Uh, Melanie and I stopped sometime and we just began to talk about, it. can you believe such and such happened? And had that not happened, this would not have happened. And you see just these stringing together of things that God speaks, and he shows you, and you react, and you follow what God said. And as a result of those things, just miracles take place. And so we're talking about the development of visionary leadership. What you're going to find is God is going to give you these things incrementally that are really going to uh, transcend anything that you can just figure out intellectually. And you've got to be willing to walk with that type of endurance to get to that place. Because, you know, I see people or people come into the training center or they go out on the streets with us and they see the ministry. What people see is the fruit of 20 years of streaming together just those little increments of obedience. That's what they see. But they come and they see a million dollar building, they see buses and vans, and they see teams on the streets, and they see you guys, and they think to themselves, how did that all happen? Well, folks, that happened on our knees. That happened in the prayer closet. That happened through diligence when no one who did not. That happened when people said, you know what, why don't you just give up? That happened when, when we felt like giving up, but there was something inside of us that compelled us to come. And so if your walk and your ministry is strictly built upon information, once that information dries out or grows cold or becomes uh, old news, so to speak, and it's not something fresh that people are chasing or looking after, what's going to happen is you're going to find that your desire and your willingness to go and do what God's called you to will dry up as well. There's got to be something inside of you that transcends just that written word, so to speak. 
There's got to be something that's so utterly real to you. You've heard me say so many times, I have a greater reality than what I see, and it's what God said. That's what's real to me. I see a lot of things happening and circumstances and have had to face my share of difficulty. But for me, folks, that's not my reality. That's just something that I'm passing through on my way to the ultimate reality. When I hear what God said in his word, that I'm seated with him in heavenly places, I believe that. I believe that. And so what I want to do, I want to be faithful in the short term. That way he can find me a good and faithful servant in the long term. And so when we begin to think like that, it really simplifies everything in regards to ministry because we're not striving for position. We're not looking for recognition. Why? Because we realize that there's this one set of eyes on us, and it's the eyes of the, the Spirit of God that's, that's, that's going about looking for those that he can show himself strong on behalf of, whose hearts are perfect towards him. And so we're in the discussion of, of development of visionary leadership. Really, it's got to it's gotta move from a place of saying, well, if I do such and such, then will I have a position? If I do such and such, then will somebody recognize me as a vocational ministry minister or I have a title on the front of my business card? Folks, at the end of the day, none of this stuff really means a thing to me. You know, most of this stuff is just a, 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 a means of identifying something to someone else. But that's not where I have my value. I have my value in what God has entrusted me with that God calls me by name. And so as we're going through this, you're going to see some of those things. Over the next 10 weeks, uh, here's some things that I believe that you're going, to, uh, you're going to learn and really learn what it means to truly lead people from a visionary platform. One of the biggest, I think, hindrances we have in leadership is when people are put in a place of leadership, they don't lead from a visionary platform. Here's what I mean by that. I look at the ministry of Jesus, for instance. Who was Jesus? It's not a trick question. Who was Jesus? He was God made flesh. How much power did he possess? All power was given to him. How much of that power did he wield when he came and walked on this earth? Very, very little. And so he had all power. He had access to all power. Obviously, he walks in all authority because everything that was created was created by him and for him. And so within his sovereignty, he had the ability to lead, to do, to strike fear into the hearts of men. But part of the leadership model that he set as that visionary to bring people back to him, because when he looked at the multitudes, how was he moved? He was moved with compassion. And so his leadership model brought him to a place of not moving with that authority, but being moved with compassion. But a lot of times we think that once we get into a position or a place, I want to get there. That way I can tell everyone what to do. You see that. You see that model. Then I don't have to, quote, unquote, do such and such. Somebody else can do that. But Jesus come and he laid his life down. So Jesus' visionary model was to come and not to be served, but to what? But to serve. And so he demonstrated a tremendous amount of restraint. Visionary leadership, when you, when you lead from a place of vis a visionary platform, what you're going to see is one of the primary fruits of the Spirit that has to take place in your life will be that of self-control. If you're failing at self-control, you will fail at visionary leadership. If you're a person that, is, that finds yourself just, just reacting to circumstances, what do you find yourself being that, that guy that's on a, an emotional roller coaster, that girl in, in some cases obviously uh, on an emotional roller coaster and, and become unpredictable? That is a lack of self-control. That is a lack of demonstrating the characteristics that not only Jesus demonstrated, but part of it was implanted in us through the person of the Holy Spirit taking up residence in our life. And so you're going to learn how to lead people from a visionary platform that was modeled by Jesus. Also, you're going to uh, learn to decipher the difference between simply good ideas and actual vision. You know, we call it good ideas versus God ideas. Folks, not every good idea, even a good moral idea, or something that's not inherently evil, is vision. Because I talk to people a lot and they say, well, listen, i got a vision to you know, get, a, get a, a, a truck and convert it into a mobile kitchen and, and go around the country and feed people and, and have, a, have a PA system. Well, that's not vision. That's a good idea. Or I have a vision to, 
to buy a bunch of bounce houses and, and, and go out and minister to a bunch of kids and, and do stuff. That's not vision. That's a good idea. Because vision doesn't require equipment. Vision just requires a heart that's perfect towards Him. And so you're going to discover how to determine the difference between vision versus uh, the, the, the difference between just good ideas. Folks, listen. We had a vision for Raven Ministries International before we even had a building for Raven Ministries International. The vision of Raven Ministries International, if we could just use it as a platform for this, since everyone in this class is involved in this ministry, it existed for 20 years without a building, without equipment, without, quote-unquote, the stuff that people think you have to have to see the fulfillment of a vision. And so vision has nothing to do with the stuff. It has nothing to do with the bells and whistles. It has something to do with your heart and a willingness to grab a hold of what God has penetrated you with that you cannot back off, you cannot back down because you're not responding to circumstances. What you're doing is you're responding to the voice of the Lord. You have set your face like a plant, and you're going to do it no matter what, what you have or what you do not have. And so you're going to begin to see the difference between good ideas and actual vision or God ideas. And you're going to see some of the, find out some of those primary stumbling blocks uh, that will face visionary leaders. And some of you are, are seeing them and having to overcome some of them. Also, you'll see some strategic steps in understanding and walking in visionary uh, leadership. Folks, for me, I could not have taught this class 25 years ago when I started the ministry. Couldn't have taught it. I couldn't have taught this class 20 years ago when we started Raven Ministries. Couldn't have taught it. Couldn't have started this class 13 years ago when Melanie and I loaded up the kids and we uh, had all of our belongings in a school bus and came, you know, couldn't have taught the class then. Couldn't have taught it, what, nine years ago now when we moved to Daytona and it started. Could not have taught it back then. Why do you think that is? Is it because I didn't have anything to say? It's because I wasn't qualified to have this conversation then. Because what happens with visionary leadership, visionary leadership is something that's qualified over time. And, and, and here's an example that, that, that this is something the Lord has showed me recently. Now, I take this Bible, for instance. Let me take, take Audrey right there in the back. I just told you what it was, but if I held this up, what would you say this was? Bible. You'd say this was Bible. Okay. Sure. That's good. Now, what if I went like, are you still watching me? What if I went like that and I said, am I flipped to the Older New Testament? Old Testament. Well, if I ask you what book of the Bible that was, can you see that? No. Can't see that. What if I ask you to read something on the page? Obviously, you couldn't see that either, right? But you know it's a Bible, right? You know I was in the Old Testament. Why? Because you saw the general place that I had flipped to. Folks, listen. 25 years ago, I saw a Bible in the distance. You hear me? 35 years ago, it, it, it just... Nearly 15 as a teenager, I saw something in the distance. But I couldn't make out exactly what it was. That's where vision was beginning to get birthed. But it just looked like something that was on the distance and the horizon. But see, as, as vision moves closer to you, what happens? You begin to see the details of those things. And see, some of y'all, it's kind of like the song that there's a promise coming down a dusty road. You see, you see the silhouette of Jesus coming over the hill to bring uh, healer, uh, healing into the house of Jairus. And so you, you can tell it's him because you're accustomed to his outline, but you don't know what he's going to say. You don't know what he's going to do. You don't know the purpose for his visitation. And so what ends up happening? Well, a few things can happen. You know, for me, it took me uh, this long to get close enough to be able to read, so to speak, the words on the page. Because from a distance, what ends up happening, when, when you don't allow it to, to come into full possession, what you start doing is you just kind of become spiritually arrogant and you just make it up as you go. That's just the reality. I was talking to somebody recently and I said, man, I just praise God for his goodness and mercy. Because when I just saw God in the distance and I wanted to close that gap on my own terms and define what God said on my own terms, all I was is just an arrogant, snot-nosed, prideful individual that God just had a lot of mercy on. Here's what I deserve. Here's what I can say. Here's what I can do. I feel obligated to win every argument, to just blow people up. Why? Because I could. Because I could talk faster to them. I could out-argue them. I could hit them with more stuff and more rhetoric than they could ever pitch back at me. And so, man, look what I did. Well, look what I did. 
I did absolutely nothing but bring reproach to, upon the name of Jesus. And so, folks, what you've got to do is you've got to be willing to allow God over time to close that gap. We see it all the time. You know, for me, I, I praise God for a few things. I praise God that I didn't have my first personal computer until 1996. Praise God for it. I'd already been preaching the gospel and had enough hair skin off my head in five years of ministry and in raising a family. That by the time I got that, you know what, I'd learned a few lessons. I just, I, I just praise God that when I got it, there wasn't this social networking and there wasn't this stuff called Facebook. Because I can't imagine the things that I would have done. <laughs> really, I can't, I can't imagine. I, I see some of the, 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 the people on there, people I know, they get on there and clown and they become these armchair prophets and all this stuff. And, 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 and they think they know so much. And I'm thinking to myself, if you were sitting here, I would show you just how much you don't know. But what happens, you function in this anonymity, and it really becomes just a great arrogance because you can copy and paste or quote from the right uh, Ravenhill, or you can quote from the right person here, and, and you can say this and that. You think you've arrived. Now, I could do a, 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 I could come through this place here today and ask you, what have you accomplished? How many ministries have you raised up? How many families and children have you raised? Renee? None. Okay? So you haven't arrived. You're still on that journey, right? You know, John James, good kid. But what, 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 what is it that you've accomplished up to this point? What is it in ministry that you've established that's going to be lasting and, and it's going to resonate? Nothing up to this point, right? You know, Brian, you've graduated from the School of Urban Missions. You're participating in the ministry. But up to this point, you're still in that holding pattern. So I can go across the room and do that. And so if we think to ourselves that just because we got the right... A t shirt, or we're part of the right ministry, or we have the right leader, and all those type of things, and we suddenly arrive, or we can go and, and copy and paste the right thing. What we've done is we've abandoned the foundation of visionary leadership in our own lives. And so, what God does, He's got to bring us to that place of humility. That's where visionary leadership has got to start. We've got to humble ourselves in the presence of the Almighty God and realize that even if we have done those things, folks, I've preached around the world, raised a family, got kids and grandkids, but at the end of the day, I've accomplished absolutely nothing in comparison to who Jesus Christ is. Anything that I've seen, anything that I've done, is strictly because of God's mercy. It wasn't because Troy Bond figured something out. It's because God reached down in my fallibility and he found something that he desired to use and he could bring the world to himself. That's it. I'd like to say that I had a college industry or something, but anything I got, God has given it to me. And so if you're going to walk and be a visionary leader, it's got to start with humility. Why? Because he gives what? Grace. He gives what? He gives Grace. influence. Grace. He gives his divine influence. So if I want to be influential, what do I have to be? I've got to be influenced. Because with whatever measure I measure out, it's going to be measured to me so I can measure out some more. And so I've got to come under the influence of God. And the only way as a leader that I can be influenced by Him is to humble myself before Him. God, I don't have the answers. God, I need you. God, I, I want you to do a work in my life, Lord God. God, you've got to, to, to try me. You've got to test me. You've got to search me and see if there's anything that would impede you moving through my life and be willing to stay the course, be willing to allow God to bring us through those things, to endure those, those trials and those tribulations and not cut those things short. I, I remember when I was just, you know, getting into trying to, 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 to find my way through that call that God had up on my life. And I, I remember one time just complaining. I was, I was actually still working in the banking and finance industry. And, but, man, I just, you know what? I, man, I, I got that preach in me. You know what I'm saying? Man, I just want to preach. I got to preach. I got to preach. I didn't realize that there was street corners everywhere I lived that I could go preach on, too. Why? Because I've been churchianity if I if I'm going to use that weird word for that. And so I thought that, of achieving my calling was somebody recognizing that calling and allowing me to preach in the church. That's what I thought. You know, praise God that I've matured past that to this point. But I remember saying, you know what, God, if you don't let me preach the gospel, I'd be willing to dig ditches. Be careful what you ask for. And I remember one hot summer day up in the Texas Panhandle. I was in a hole digging a ditch with uh, Thomas Derrick, Pastor Thomas in, uh, in, in Florida, his older brother was my associate pastor. Him and I are digging a hole. And we're just digging away, singing some song or whatever else. And I looked at him, he's sweat dripping off both of us. We're just 
black with dirt. And I looked at him and I said, brother, I'm sorry. And he said, for what? I said, this is my fault. I said, what do you mean it's your fault? I said, man, I told God, if you let me preach the gospel, I'd be willing to dig ditches. And I said, he put me to the test and we're digging a ditch. But you know what? I kept preaching the gospel. And I kept digging ditches, whatever it took to do and to facilitate what God had called me to do. Folks, your vision has got to be bigger than your circumstance. Your vision has got to be bigger than your circumstance. If you allow circumstance to derail your vision, you do not have vision. You have a good idea. The reason that this class is called Visionary Leadership Development because at best, all we can hope to is to further develop and move us just a little bit closer to that target to, before those details of that vision began to materialize. Folks, listen. There is no quick fix. There is no fire tunnel that you can run through and we have a transference of the anointing and all this stuff. That's just a bunch of garbage. Do you hear me? It's going to cost you. You hear me? It's going to cost you your life. It's going to cost you your desires. It's going to cost you your wants. It's going to cost you all those things. It's going to cost you all your good ideas to deliver the God idea. It's going to cost you. First Corinthians chapter 13, turn there. We'll give you something tonight that maybe you've never thought of. You're familiar with that 13th chapter there? Let's move past all the really, really love stuff that we like to camp out on. Let's move to verse 11. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Obviously, Paul the Apostle speaking, who is obviously a tremendous, tremendous visionary. He said this. He said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. He said, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, I know in part, but then I shall even be known as I am known. He said, when I was a child, that's a word that's in the Greek, it's nepalos, and it literally can be translated, before I was enlightened or had been given the spiritual knowledge and insight into the situation. I want to say that again. Before I was enlightened or had been given the spiritual knowledge or insight into the situation. So Paul the Apostle said, listen, there was a time that I had not yet been enlightened, that I had not yet been received any type of spiritual insight uh, into where I was, even as he, we know that he was a religious man. Before I came to the place that I am now, I was somewhere else. See, here's the thing, folks, and we know Paul. He talked about before he came to Christ, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was circumcised the eighth day. Uh, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. He said concerning zeal, he persecuted the church. We, we saw all of his credentials. I mean, this was a guy that was educated, you know, taught and studied at the feet of the meal. I mean, he had everything in regards to information. And so Paul was informed. Write that down. Paul was informed. But the problem was Paul was not enlightened. Paul was informed. Paul was not enlightened. I had a guy come up to me the night on the streets, and uh, some of you probably saw him, kind of a big, wide-headed guy, just, just a boasting, proud guy, stood right in front of the church, sorry, in front of the church, street church. He stood right in front of the cross, and he looked at me, and he said, so, what rock bottom did you have to crawl out from to come to this mess? And I said, well, I can tell you where I came from. I said, but man, you wouldn't think it was rock bottom. You'd think it was success and wonder why I ever turned away from it. I said, no, if you're implying that I was some drug addict or I was some alcoholic, I said, what in those things? If you're, if you're thinking that I was just some skid row dropout, high school dropout, I said, what in those things either? I said, I, I, I was a great student, never tried drugs in my life, never done those things, and you know, I was going to fast, my, fast track myself into a career. I said, so my rock bottom, you probably wouldn't have thought it was rock bottom. In other words, I was enlightened, okay? I was enlightened from a young age. I was without excuse. You know, I, 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 I remember reading David Wilkerson's Crossing the Switchblade when I was like six years old. I mean, 
I was introduced to things like that, and those things were around me. So I, I was in light. I was in, excuse me, I was informed, but I wasn't enlightened. And so I had a lot of good information. I, I remember in high school, you know, living as a backslider, we'd sit in a, a, a class and somebody'd bring up something, and, and I remember, you know, just shooting down the scripture and all this stuff, and or my Baptist friends at lunch that were once saved, always saved. Uh, you know, I, I didn't believe once saved, always saved, and sure wasn't living like I believed you could uh, abandon or, or forfeit your salvation, but sure, I sure have to argue in those cases with people. And so here I was, I had a lot of good information, but I wasn't enlightened. And so he said, before I was enlightened, my thinking was directly connected to that vantage point. That's what Paul was saying. I thought from that perspective, my vantage point was that which was informed, but not enlightened. See, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out on a, on, a, on a branch tonight because I don't think it's a creaky branch. Some of you that are here tonight at this stage, you're still at the very much informed stage, but not enlightened. And so you're informed based upon what you've been taught. You're informed based upon the experiences that have been given to you. You're, you're, you're informed because things have been handed to you. You've been given an opportunity, a, a freedom. I, I was talking to somebody just recently offered up some counsel, and they were talking about that God was bringing them through this, giving them a, a great revelation of, of the sufferings of Christ based upon their situation. And I looked at them and I said, you're going through the sufferings of Christ based upon your situation? And they told me, yeah, I've had to suffer many things. Well, they suffered many things, uh, but they did it in their own hand. Why? Because somebody's taking care of this person. They never have to miss a meal. If they need a car, they can borrow somebody's car. I mean, this is a person that doesn't suffer. <coughs> this is a person that's got everything handed to them every single day of their life. But they thought they were suffering. But see, when we just informed but not enlightened, we're willing to call just about anything what we want to call it to get what we want. You hear what I'm saying? And so some of you that are here today, you've been handed opportunities. Listen, you get to stand in an arena where you get to reap where you have not sown. I'll just put it that way. You get to benefit from something that you've really never had to lay your life down for. You know, Renee, you can come into a place like this, maybe you can get an opportunity for ministry, maybe I can put you up on a box with a microphone and a Bible in your hand, and maybe you can preach like a house of fire and you do a fantastic job out there. What if you really had to pay for to do that? Because whether there was a day when we had to literally fight people off of us, now, we see a little bit of nonsense periodically, but I'm talking about your ability to stand on that soapbox in the middle of Bourbon Street did not exist 20 years ago. We didn't even bring, when Mel and I would come back in the mid-90s, we did not even take our teams to Bourbon Street because of the, the, the amount of violence that was extended against people. I'm talking about people throwing bottles off of balconies and hitting you in the head. I'm talking about that level of violence you see what I'm saying? Now, what's happened? Well, endurance has happened. Something's happened in the spiritual realm. Now, those same people that are going on now aren't the same people that was there then. Right. But through walking out that vision and enduring over time, something has been unseated spiritually. God has honored that. Now, folks, I can say that to you, but you know what? Somebody can say that to me, too. Why? Because it didn't start with this guy. Somebody has paved the way. And so many times what we're doing is we're coming in the spiritual coattails and the benefits that somebody else has sold for us. And I praise God for that. I praise God that 20 years ago it was just a bottle and it wasn't a bullet. You, you see what I'm saying? And so many of you that you've been handed a tremendous opportunity, hope you've been raised in, you, you know, your family from, from day one for you, you never knew anything but the gospel. And so... For, for you to transgress and ever walk away from that, that's just a snot-nosed brat that doesn't realize where they came from. You hear what I'm saying? And so any time that you deviate from that vision, that call that God has placed upon your life, you should tremble in fear. Why? Because of how easy God has made it for you to serve God. He's made it easy for you. And so if we think that we've suffered, folks, not a single one of us has suffered, quote-unquote, unto blood of you see what I'm saying? Oh, we had to, to eat a hamburger rather than a steak, or we had to 
keep the, 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 the air conditioner turned down a little bit uh, less than what we want. But whatever, you see what I'm saying? We have not really done that. And so we think that we've suffered, we've gone through some things. Listen, folks, listen, there may come a day when we do, whether it's in our lifetime and the wheels come off of these things or not. I, I'm, I'm not prognosticating those type of things. But what I'm saying is that we can't think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. Everything that we have and receive, we have because God has given it to us. And so he said, before I was enlightened, I think it was directly connected to that vantage point that I had. And some of us, we have a false vantage point. Oh, I'm going through it. I've really suffered. I had it hard. I haven't had it hard. I always confess to you, I have, I've had it pretty easy, even with alcoholic parents and everything else. At least they came home at night. You, you see what I'm saying? I have never had it hard compared to what I've seen in the Word. You know, have I been talked about? Have I had my ears filled open? I, I've had all that stuff. And at the end of the day, I haven't really had to go through anything. Period. Nothing to it. Easy stuff. I go to the street, I get cussed out. Big deal. I don't consider that persecution. I don't consider that any uh, rainbow Christianity. That's just reasonable service. Uh, I, I'm not walking out there fearful of my life that I'm like somebody that's in some Middle Eastern country that's going to get their head cut off. Well, I don't walk out there with that type of fear. You hear me? And so I'm not going to try to make it some grandiose thing that I'm suffering and putting myself on the line. No, I'm giving people an opportunity to see Jesus. That's big enough for me that I don't have to downplay the act that I'm doing something that I'm putting myself in harm's way. You know what I'm saying? That's a real vantage point. Before I was enlightened, Paul said, I thought I was enlightened. Or one lacking the necessary insight. Folks, that's what to be enlightened is. I have a necessary insight that God has given me based upon a true foundation. And so if you're enlightened, if you have that experience that God has given you, you're going to walk in the right vantage point. He said, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. When I was a child, I thought I was a child, I understood as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. I put away and rendered totally inoperable. Here's what that literally means. I put away I rendered totally inoperable and obsolete those things that were associated with my pre previous condition that was informed but not enlightened. He said, listen, when I became a man, all that stuff that I used to build upon, the vantage point that I used to have, that I thought I knew what I was doing, that, that, that I thought I had vision, that I thought I had some great plan, that God was going to use me in all these fantastic ways. He said, listen, my vantage point changed and I can render those things obsolete. But I was 15 years old, I'm praying, and the Lord speaks to me just as real as can be, and it informs me, so I thought, that I'm going to preach to thousands. Now, was that a word from the Lord? Or was that a word that I was watching the Jimmy Swagger crusade the night before on television? You hear me? And I thought, okay, that's what ministry looks like. It's, it's, it's Jimmy Swagger preaching before 90,000 people in Brazil. And so, Man, if I'm going to be a minister, that's the goal that I have. Well, I have preached to thousands, maybe one at a time. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? And so, is that going to be my vantage point of something that I thought was God that wasn't? No, I put away childish things. I said, God, you know what? I don't care if it's one person I'm preaching to or if it's 50,000. You got a question? Yeah, can you do the definition for enlightenment one more time? The, uh, oh, enlightened? The necessary is God giving me the necessary spiritual insight? Based upon... We'll get into that. Okay. And he said, so before I was enlightened, I was informed but not enlightened. i got something for you to consider. Proverbs 23.7 tonight. Proverbs 23.7. Does that ring a bell anyone when I say Proverbs 23.7? The address might, but as soon as I say it, you'll know exactly what it is. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Somebody say that. Say that again, Lord. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. How many times have you heard that? Lots of times. You've heard that lots of times. I've heard it thousands of times over many years. But we missed it. You said it and you missed it. 
You know why I missed it? Because since I tell you this, you're going to say, I've never seen that before. Notice it doesn't say what a man thinks, but rather as a man thinks. See, what's happening in churchianity today, we think what a man thinks in his heart, rather than as or how a man thinks. See, we get so caught up on the what, that we forget the why. Yeah. You hear me? As a man thinks, not what a man thinks. Well, how do I know that? Because all you have to do is have a conversation with somebody that feels called to the ministry for a minute. You know what it's all about? It's all about the what. You hear me? It's what God called me to do, or what God has for me, or what wife, or what husband, or what ministry position, or what mission trip, or what, what, what. And so we, we're so caught up in a what rather than an as. Because if I can get the as down, the what really doesn't matter. Because if I'm as Christ, if I'm functioning as he desires to me to be, really what the vision, how it materializes in my heart and life, I'm still going to play the way. I'm still going to be faithful. Why? Because I'm not aiming at the what. And so when I say, listen, look, uh, what a man thinks in his heart, so shall he be. And so what I'm thinking is, is God's going to send me to the, to the nations. I'm going to open up uh, an orphanage, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to... Uh, uh, preaching around the Caribbean on, on the deck of ships and uh, feeding around for a farm or whatever, and I'm going to do something like that. That's what I'm going to do. Rather than the as. As a man thinks in his heart. And so what shall that as be? And so when I was a child, I thought, as a child. See, there's the as. He didn't say when I was a child, I thought, what a child. I thought, from the capacity, or I, I thought from the from the, the visionary platform of a child. And so it became all about what. Now, folks, in, in a room like this, when I say some of you are still at the information stage, the reason being is because you still define ministry by what you do. Rather than as you do. Because what you do is always going to be circumstantial, it'll be geographical, it'll be vocational. And so I'm not really in ministry until I'm full-time ministry. I'm not really in ministry until I go and do such and such, or I preach in this church. Folks, that's what we want. And so as long as I'm pursuing after the one, I can do that in my own way. I can do that in my own ability. I can do that in my own strength. I can make enough connections to fill my time with all these wants. But then, what's the what? Well, it's the Matthew chapter 7. I did all of these things in your name. I did what? Well, I cast out devils. I did what? I prophesied. I did what? I did miracles. That's all the want. Rather than the as, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you as somebody that I was intimate with. So, folks, we need to think as Christ thinks in regards to ministry, in regards to leadership, then what ends up happening? Well, we never back down, we never back away, we never go away, we never give up, we never burn out, because it ceases to do be what we do, and it becomes who we are. If you're going to be a visionary leader, it can never be about what you do. Right. It's going to be about who you are. Come on. Then whatever you do becomes easy. Because you don't care what you do. You know, man, I'll tell you what, it'd probably be a little bit more lucrative if we could find somewhere else to minister besides the middle of the street with a bunch of drums. Right. Don't you find humor when they say y'all are just out here for the money? Isn't that the funniest thing you've ever heard? Right. Now, a few of y'all, for some reason, people walk in and have that $20 bill. I'm not one of them usually. Yeah. Some of y'all are, are benefit from that, but... Even at, even at that rate, it's not like somebody's <laughs> doing a cottage industry and, and, and paying their bills because they're preaching under a duct tape or red cross on Broadway Street. That's an ass thing. That's not a right thing. That's we're going to go out there and we're going to preach the gospel regardless of that seemingly God-forsaken environment because we're going to go as he's called us. When I was a child, I thought as a child. I was a child and I thought like one. But when I started to think like a man, then I became a man and started thinking like a man. And so, when you begin to think like Jesus thought, you're going to think like a man thinks. You're going to think like somebody that's mature in the faith is going to think. 
Visionary leadership is more about how you think than what you think. Write that down. Visionary leadership is more about how you think than what you think. Let me explain that to you a little clearer. Giving a vision is not the same as having vision. Getting a vision is not the same as having vision. Acts 2.17. You know it. In the last days. Who says? In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Right? All people. Now, what's the next line? Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. We sing it, we preach it, we shout it, we proclaim it. God says, in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men, what men? Young, young. young men will see vision. Think about that in regards to what Paul said right there in 1 Corinthians 13, 11 through 12. When I was a child, when I was a young man, I thought, understood, spoke as a child. I'm going to pour my spirit out. And you know what's going to happen when I pour my spirit out? The young men are going to have visions, but the old men are going to dream dreams. But he said, preacher, what are you getting at? I'm about to tell you. He says, they will have visions. They will have horasis. H-O-R-A-S-I-S. H-O-R-A-S-I-S. That's a good English spelling of the Greek word. It means they will have sight. In other words, they'll see stuff. What will the young men do? They'll see stuff. You know what most people get into ministry? Desire to get into leadership? Huh? Because they want to see stuff. That's what they don't want to do. They want to see stuff. Why do people go on mission trips? They will see stuff. And so, it's going to happen in the last days. I'm going to pour out my spirit, and the young men are going to see stuff. They will have sight but they won't necessarily have insight. Do you hear me? They're going to have sight, but they won't necessarily have insight. Here's an observation. You've seen it. I know I have for many, many years. Have you ever noticed that people who are prone to getting visions typically only see the problem associated with that vision? <laughs> you ever notice that? People that are prone to visions typically are seeing earthquakes destroying cities. People that are prone to visions see the collapse of financial markets. People that are prone to visions, it's always, they always see the problem in the vision. You know what It's so every vision is in, in God's hand. He's, he's sitting in heaven waiting for the newspaper to come out and for the ringing of the bell and the New York Stock Exchange to see if he can send his son Jesus back in. Has it fell enough points? Has the S&P futures? Has the has NASDAQ collapsed yet so I can come and get my people? If you're, if you're nervous, that's what they see. Everything with people prone to visions is always about something bad going to happen. It's always about a tornado going to destroy this, or, or a hurricane is going to blow this up, or a tsunami is going to invade this, or some great army is going to invade Syria. You, you see what I'm saying? It's always people that are prone to visions always see the problem associated with that vision. Think about it. You take people who flock to prophecy conferences, the biggest percentage of those people, all they talk about is chaos and calamity. All oh, the ends coming, the ends coming. But they don't really live and act like the end is coming. Yeah, really. you, you know what I'm saying? And so, for instance, let me give you an object lesson here. I brought this in. Here's what it's like. I got this bag. This bag's got a bunch of stuff in it. Okay? It's got a bunch of odds and ends. I could give you this bag that's got all this stuff in it. And you know what you're going to have? You're going to have a bag full of stuff. Now, you may know what some of those pieces look like. You may recognize them. But if I gave them to somebody that had never worked with those type of tools and stuff, they're going to think, what on earth is this for? Okay? And so people that have vision are like somebody that's been handed a bag full of stuff. But people that are visionaries, they got this thing right here. 
I got the instructions on the stuff. See, I know what to do with the stuff because I've got the insight, not just the sight. I don't just got the bag that's zipped up and I know there's a bunch of stuff in it, but I've got a book that tells me what to do with every single thing in there. I don't just see a problem of a bag full of stuff. I see the solution because God has given me the insight through the Spirit. So folks, listen, we've got to move past just having a bag of stuff type of mentality in regards to ministry, in regards to visionary leadership. We've got to say, God, I want you to give me not just the side of it, but I want to get you give you would give me the inside. And so visions, when you're talking about your young men will have visions, let me give you a definition for that. It's just a glance into the supernatural. It's a glance into the supernatural. Your young men will see visions. I'll see just a glance into the supernatural. And so if I have visions, I just get a, a glance. I just get a little flash. And you know what it is about me? It's kind of like when I worked in banking, periodically they would do a fake bank robbery. They wouldn't tell anybody but the branch manager and somebody else. And they would have these men rush in and do all these things. And people would be in this wholesale panic. It was just crazy. Obviously, they'd tell the guards so they wouldn't shoot anybody and stuff like that. <coughs> then when they leave, the police would come in that had orchestrated this, and they begin to ask people questions. Who's a witness? Who got to see that? Somebody raised their hand. What color shirt was that guy wearing? They'd ask you questions like that. And you know what? Most people were wrong. How tall do you think that guy? Oh, that guy had to be about six foot two. They said, okay, let's walk that guy in. He said he had a blue shirt and he's six foot two. Well, he was about five foot eight. And he had a green shirt on. Because all they got was a glance of him, but they thought they could identify the perpetrator. Folks, that's the way most people do that consider themselves to be visionaries. They consider themselves to be leaders. They consider themselves to be ministers. All they do is get a glance of the supernatural. But you know what vision will do for you? It will create a pathway for you into the supernatural. Vision just gives you a glance Visions just give you a glance, but vision will create a pathway for you in the supernatural. Visions are the what? Vision is the as. So Paul said, young men are the enlightened ones or Actually, the book of Acts, God said, young men, the mighty ones, those with sight but not insight, don't get a glance into the supernatural. What should we live in the last days? I don't know that. Huh? What's it say? Perilous times. Okay. Men will be lovers of themselves. Mm -hmm. Lovers of money Both rather than lovers of God. Okay, that's Second Timothy chapter three. Okay, which was probably written what forty years after the Book of Acts. Which has probably happened ever since then. Yeah. I'm just saying, but forty years after the Book of Acts. Well, so I had to wait forty years before I knew that that word was going to come. No, I just had to go back here to the prophecy that he spoke of from the prophet Joel. I know we're living in the last days. Why? Because young men are going to have sight, but not inside. See, folks, it's not the condition of the world that tells me we're living in the last days. It's the condition of the church. Right. Do you hear me? Because what we see is we see a generation rising up that has seen some things, but they've had sight, but not really insight. And so now they've been given a platform. They've been given a platform in churches. They've been given a platform through social media. They've been given this platform. And you see they've got sight. They've got a glimpse of something. But when push comes to shove, they really don't have any insight of anything. They've got a lot of zeal, but they don't have a lot of wisdom. And so I know we're living in the last days. Why? Because the, 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 the prevalence of that type of spirit rising up within the church. There's no depth. There's all there are is these, these little glances and these little uh, uh, quick glances and looks at things. But he said this. He said, your old men or those with insight will carve a pathway 
into the supernatural. The first one, young man, is problem focused. The second is solution established. Write that down. Your young men, they're going to be problem focused. Your old men or those with spiritual insight are going to be solution established. Do you tend to be problem focused or solution established? Think about it. Be honest with yourself. Do you tend to be problem focused or solution established? Until recently, problem focused. Problem focused. Most of your life, problem focused. Problem focused? Yeah. Folks, that's the bulk of the church. How do you know that? Well, once again, we, we have a vehicle to look. Everything's problem focused. I, I was sharing with some of you guys, I, I can't remember what my name is, but a brother of the Lord, it's a precious brother, he called me up one day, and, and one of these false teacher type guys was going into their state and, and getting all these churches together and promoting this, this false doctrine type of thing around quote unquote revival. And he called me up to, to, to get some, uh, some wisdom on how to go and rebuke all of them. So he said, he's a good brother. He loves Jesus. But he's scared. He said, hey, can you give me advice on what would be the best way to, to go into that big meeting and rebuke all those people? I said, my best advice is you not to do that. <laughs> I said, you don't, have a, you don't have a platform to do that. Right. I said, you just be some kooky person that goes in there. You just be as kooky as they are just in a different way. Right. I said, what you need to do is go do what God told you to do. Stop so much as worried about them. I said, then one day you might have a platform to speak some correction to somebody. I said, but you can't even get your own stuff together now. Come on. I said, go establish something. Go do something. Go, go get some legs underneath you. Go endure over time. Go persevere for a while. And I said, then call me up in about 15 or 20 years if the Lord tarries, and then, then ask me if you should go do that. And I told him, I said, listen, I used to think the same way. I used to be the one that had a lot of sight, but not a whole lot of insight. And so I was always looking to pick some fight, always looking to blow somebody up, always looking to do this and that. But to what end? Well, I know what the end was, but I did. I showed them up. I'm the big man on campus. And look at me. I'm God's prophetic voice for the, for the, for the, for the season. I wasn't at all. I was just an arrogant little punk that somebody needed to snatch me up. That's what I was. And so I see what it looks like. I talk the language. I look that way. I, I, I carry those mannerisms. I, I plagiarized other people's uh, hear from God and call them out. I do that. I know what it looks like. I know what it sounds like. But that don't mean I had to keep doing that. When I was a child, that was the platform that I functioned off of. But when I got some spiritual insight, I said, no more. I'm abandoning that way of thinking. And I'm just not going to do it anymore. And so the first is problem focus. The second is solution established. That is how they think, so they are. When I think that way, that's what I am. And so if I'm always thinking about the problem, what am I? I'm a problem. And from a visionary leadership standpoint, I'm always thinking about the solution, what am I? I'm a solution. I become an answer guy. I become a solution guy. I become somebody that it becomes easy to follow. You're willing to, to, to track it down. See, that's what people are looking for. That's what the body of Christ is desperate for. It's somebody that's not so always focused upon what's falling apart. Why? Right? Because, folks, it's always falling apart. Right. In this world, do you think you're not going to have tribute? I guess you will. But I will become the world. And so am I going to be an overcomer or am I going to be overcame? Well, if I want to develop a visionary type of leadership mentality, it's not that I'm constantly going to say, man, that ain't going to work. Folks, there's not a single thing that we do as a ministry that should work. You hear? It really shouldn't in the natural. But it does in the supernatural. Why? Because old men shall dream dreams. There's a pathway that's been carved into the promises of God through endurance over time. There are many people that have visions, but very few willing to pay the price, endure the trials, and wait patiently to become a visionary. Do you hear me? A lot of people have visions, but nobody's willing to pay the price or endure the trials to become a visionary. Most would be willing to simply observe the Bible from across the room, like Audrey was earlier, and just fill in the blanks. 
with what seems right or seems reasonable and possess anything that's both never really possess anything that's sustainable or reproducible. Folks, those having visions will typically be unbridled, they'll lack accountability, and in their lives they'll be loners. I want to say it again, those that are prone to being having visions without being visionaries, they'll be unbridled, they'll lack accountability in their lives, and they will be loners. I've met them for years and years, and I continue to cross paths with those folks. Show me a person that's prone to visions, and I'm going to show you a person that falls into two or probably three of those categories I just gave you. Have you been there? Heard that? Said that? Maybe you were that? But those having vision will typically be disciplined, they'll be deliberate, and they'll be, tend to be facilitators for other people. If you want to be a visionary, you're going to be a disciplined person. You're going to be a person that's very deliberate in everything that you do, and you're going to be a person that is constantly facilitating other people because visionaries exist for the benefit of 